Welcome to the number one leadership show anywhere on any platform, broadcast, digital, doesn't matter. Lessons in Leadership, Steve Adubato, Mary Gamba. Mary, looking good today. First show yeah. of the day. First show of the day and just really looking forward to kicking it off with a great show. And yeah, I think you're right. Not I think, I know I will uh, clarify that. We are, I believe, one of the only leadership shows and it's the best. It is. And we kick off the program with our good friend, Kevin O'Toole. There he is right there. Kevin O'Toole is the managing partner of a very prominent law firm in our region. O'Toole, Scrivo, and Scrivo, and is that Tom Scrivo? The one and only. <laughs> the, the single best lawyer in the state of New Jersey. Yeah, by the way, you and Scrivo, uh, I, and, and Tom was has had many positions in government as well, but have been a lawyer in private practice for years. You guys met when? Uh, August of 1986, first day of law school. Are you serious? Serious, 36 years ago. How did you? First day. Connection immediately? Yeah, so we, so we were in the C-section and we get put with a group of like 200 students and he's literally next to me. And there's another kid from Cedar Grove, Tom was from North Caldwell, I was from Cedar Grove. The three of us sat together and Tom and I hit off day one and have been, uh, you know, the best of buds for the last 36 years. And we talked about Ben putting a law firm together and he went big law and he did all those important positions. And I just kind of had the, my little profile and he's helped me with even my first campaign manager back in 1989 and all that other stuff. And then uh, opportunity came about six years ago after he was chief counsel to the governor. I said, let's go and fulfill our lifelong dream of having a law firm together. And that's what happened. Uh, thank you for disclosing. I did not know that history, but uh, Kevin's curious, Mary, uh, you and I met 22 years ago mm -hmm. uh, at a hospital. You were a patient rep or some advocate, whatever. And I was there with a, one of my many ailments. And uh, was Steve a good Mary, patient, Mary? Uh, he was definitely one of the more challenging ones. That's for sure. The yeah. requests, the requests were many. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Hypochondria comes to mind, but I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. that, I think that may have been the official diagnosis that day. <laughs> okay. We are not here to talk about all history, but we are here to talk about, hey, Kevin, listen, uh, Kevin's also the chair of the Port Authority of New York, New Jersey, a very significant public post. Kevin, let me ask you this. We've talked about this before, uh, leadership, a variety of aspects of it, but you wrote in the O'Toole Chronicles, which appear, appears where? In the Globe, every Tuesday. Our partners over at NJ Globe, David Wildstein, check out NJ Globe and Kevin's back issues of the uh, O'Toole Chronicles. What the heck is this chapter on the situational narcissist? Because Mary sent it to me right away and said, you need to read this quick. Yeah. Well, I'm curious. Did you think, Mary, because it, it sounded like, you know, it had remnants of Steve in that article? It, it definitely resonated. It definitely resonated. For anybody that's watched this show, we definitely have disclose the the small amount but i think anyone that does what we do in media has to have that little bit and any ceo president has a little bit of narcissism in their yeah, dna yeah, but, but sorry for mary, mary kevin and in, in, inter not interrupt but interpret and clarify ego versus narcissism well i mean look i think narcissism is something we've all you know heard about for many years but over when I wrote that article, I just heard about the situational narcissist or narcissism, which I'd never heard the word situational and narcissist. And it was really interesting read. And what it basically said is when a person came, a normal person, and it comes into power either through an election, a, a promotion, something he, he or she does well and, and is, is recognized, and all of a sudden they change somewhat and they become, you know, the narcissist, the classic narcissist, where it's all about them. They lack empathy. They can't have real relationships. They need validation. Um, they have it's um, they're in like an artificial world. And I think and to Mary's point, I think CEOs, I think to some extent are driven and have it. It's about them. I think politicians in particular are exceptional, classic narcissists. And I think when they are elected in particular, they become situational because they're the average individual. They get an election and all of a sudden they feel self-important. They have these special license plates and special pins they wear and they have special recognitions and they kind of forget the roots and where they've come from and they go in this bubble. And it's really interesting to watch a transformation. And it very negatively affects one's leadership. Speaking of history and leadership, Mary actually ordered this book from me. Our good friend, John Meacham, wrote this extraordinary history of Abraham Lincoln, who's talked about by a lot of people and misunderstood by more. His leadership style, his foibles, his 
um, his courage and a whole his dep- and mental health issues, a whole range of issues. But the reason I'm mentioning that is Meacham constantly talks about Abraham Lincoln's ability to empathize with those who were enslaved at the time. And it more than anything else motivated him. So before Mary jumps in, I'm curious about this. You lose your empathy, Kevin. You lose your sense of others being other centered. What's the negative, the worst negative impact on one's leadership? Well, here, here's the problem with, with politicians in particular. You can hear, you'll go to a, a focus group or you'll go to a, a conference or a town hall meeting and someone will say, well, listen, I'm dealing with a family member who has cancer and they'll talk in very stark terms about what's happening. And the average narcissist politician will say, oh, well, I have an aunt who has cancer. And then they t- t- make it about them. And they're not really empathetic. They just want to share that. It's, and they want to shift the conversation about the individual who is talking about the problem to about their problem, which is totally unrelated. So I think an individual who has empathy would say, oh, I'm sorry that your, your relative has cancer. Let's talk about it. How can we help them? Is there anything we can support group or you need help in terms of Blue Cross Blue Shield? Let's talk about things we can do and really have this well of empathy. I think the average politician doesn't have the empathy. They can pretend they do, but I think they really want to shift it and make it all about them. I think there's a big difference. By the way, uh, interchange politician with leader, and it's the same discussion. Mary, jump in. (laughs) Well, I was just going to say that, Steve. We can uh, shift the conversation 180. Kevin, can you talk a little bit about leadership development, just the opposite of that narcissistic leader? What should and what does a great leader do to make sure that they are constantly growing their team and investing in that important thing of leadership development for their team? So I think, you know, whether it's a law firm or at the port, you have to care about people, you have to listen to them. So, you know, say at the Port Authority, we'll have uh, a staff meeting, a senior staff with 30 people every Monday, and we'll sit around the table and talk about each of their divisions, talk about what they're going through. And later on, we'll have these private conversations about what, you know, going on in their life, what's happening with their kids, what's going on in the, in the social environment around them. And you just can't be about business and shut it off. It's really about caring about what they're doing and understanding what the world they're going through. And at the law firm, it's the same thing. Tom and I have 100 employees here. And any, any given day, we'll sit with the secretary, the individual in the mail room, the partners, the associates, and talk about what's going on with the cases and what's going on in their life and be invested in them as human beings, not as just colleagues or workers. I'm going to follow up on that, Mary. We had a major law firm as a client with our stand and deliver company. We were doing leadership development for them, communication training, et cetera. And the biggest thing that struck me about working with them is some of them are really good lawyers. They were good lawyers, Kevin, but then they had to become leaders. And the leap was massive, meaning they could go ahead. You're shaking your head. Because first of all, lawyers are terrible businessmen and women for starters. I think doctors and lawyers are the worst business people. By <laughs> we and work large. with both. <laughs> and listen, they're they're amazingly gifted, and they have such a a presence and a gift to give. But I really think they lack this this business acumen. This they don't teach that. I think enough either in medical school or in a law school. I really. And so one of the things we've done in our in our uh, law firm, we have really put a huge focus on the human side. Like we do a lot of like we just finished a um, a nationwide support group for food banks. We spent about $100,000, and whether it's in Chicago or in Michigan or in Houston, uh, Arkansas, uh, we literally have partnered with some of our our, our collaborators in, in across the country and spent uh, a lot of time focusing on where's the greatest need for food banks. And what we did, we shipped out a lot of our associates to these places, let them work for the day in these food banks on the service lines, and also gave a check as well, and try to ingrain in them that there are people out there that are in need. And so whether it's the Red Cross or whether it's, so we focus a lot on uh, on giving back to the communities and we want to have that trickle down to the average employee. So there's a human element, not just a business element that ripples through our, our office. And Tom and I are pretty, pretty forceful about making sure it's part of our, our daily rituals. Several segments we're doing our, our programs today, Mary, we're taping lessons in leadership, several shows in one day will be about the connection between leadership and giving back as Kevin O'Toole is talking about. Go ahead, Mary, you got a couple minutes left. Yeah, definitely. You talked about that trickle down effect. Do you find that there is a correlation, a connection between giving back and volunteerism and overall employee morale, especially tied to, we've all talked about the great resignation and people deciding to leave. Do you find that retention increases when the giving back in your organization is showing that you do care about the community? I will tell you, with the with the younger generation, they really want to be connected to the community. And I'll tell you, there's a knock on them that they don't want to work as hard as the folks that are, you know, 
that were World War II generation or the folks who are, you know, who are the 55 or 60 year old. And maybe that's true, but I think they're a much more giving generation. They want to be connected. They want to do more charitable work. Uh, it's different. And, and with the law firm now, we have to adjust ourselves post COVID. Folks don't want to come in here six days a week. They want to have flex time. They want to do other things. But the common thread with all of the employees, they all are really, they, they get really excited about giving back. And they're, not a single one will say no when I say, we're gonna go out and we're gonna give to you know a coat drive, whatever it is, we're gonna do a, a drive for breast cancer. They're all totally motivated. And that kind of bonds us all together. And that I think is uh, something we need as a society to do more of as the times are more harsh and the economy starts to continue to falter. Kevin, real quick, we're gonna have you on our public television side as well. Leadership and innovation. We're big on lessons in leadership on innovation. Terminal A at, at Newark Airport. Give me 30 seconds on how it's connected to innovation. Big expansion there. Huge. $2.7 billion, Steve. It's amazing. 33 gates. It's amazing. We're going to be able to move, you know, 50% more of the passengers. It is all high tech. It is, you'll be able to walk in there and you won't have a paper ticket. Everything is like literally from soup to nuts, from the high speed check-ins. Right now at Terminal A, the old Terminal A, there are two lanes. We're gonna have 14 lanes of a high speed check-in with the highest, most sophisticated uh, equipment with TSA. It's gonna be able to move in and out. You're gonna have electronic ticketing. It's gonna be able to just, uh, the, and your services are there top notch, whether it's food, beverage, Wi-Fi, whatever it is. The bathrooms are amazingly uh, high finish. They've got themes to them, whether it's the seaside or whether it's urban, whether it's woodlands. There's a huge connecting to New Jersey. Everything you turn around to, you see New Jersey elements in Terminal A. Hey, Mary. Yes. Status quo is what? <laughs> the status quo is never enough. It's never yeah. enough and it's never an option. It's never, it's never the best option. option. And <laughs> Kevin O'Toole just talked about it at the Port Authority. Terminal A. Newark Airport and flying pretty soon again out of there. Hey, Kevin, thank you for joining us on Lessons in Leadership. We'll pick you up on the public television side thank as you. well soon. Appreciate it. To you and your longtime partner. Tom Scrivo and Kevin O'Toole met in 1980. What? Six. I won't even the tell year. you what grade I was in, Steve. 1986. <laughs> that was the year I left the state legislature, uh, not by choice. And Kevin O'Toole had a lot to do with that as well. That's another show. No, 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 Kevin, we got to go. We're not talking about my loss. So, yeah. We're not talking about my losing, Kevin. It was you the understand? best that ever happened to you, Steve, losing 1985 to Joe, to John Kelly, and Marion Krekko. Leave it alone. Okay, situational narcissist. I know nothing about that. Lessons in Leadership, be right back after this. This edition of Lessons in Leadership is made possible by the Bucino Leadership Institute at Seton Hall University, Prager Metis, Valley Bank, the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, the North Ward Center, the New Jersey Sharing Network, Delta Dental of New Jersey, Fedway Associates, Inc., Veolia, Resourcing the World, and Seton Hall University, showing the world what great minds can do since 1856. Welcome back to Lessons in Leadership. Steve Adubato, Mary Gamba, and two of our longtime friends. All right, I use my glasses for this. I acknowledge that. It's okay. Uh, we have Dennis Wilson, President and CEO, Delta Dental of New Jersey, Delta Dental of Connecticut. And also our, our longtime friend, Anthony Tony Russo, is President, Commerce and Industry Association of New Jersey, CEO, Publisher Commerce Magazine. Good to see both of you, gentlemen. Good to see you, Steve and Mary. And, and Dennis, glad to share the stage with you today. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, I'm equally as glad. Thanks. Hey, Dennis, do us a favor. This is part of our series looking at small business and its connection to leadership. Small business, Chiron, will come up on lower third right now. And Tony's been a part of that. His, many of his members are um, leaders in the small business community. Remind everyone why we're doing this small business series and why it's so important, Dennis. Well, you know, Tony knows this, and when you look at the stats, everybody should know this. Small business is such an integral part of the New Jersey economy. Uh, you know, I don't remember the exact numbers, but I do remember the percentages that over 90% of, of, of businesses in New Jersey hire, uh, have under 100 people in their employment. So they're a tremendous part of the workforce, and over half of, uh, of the folks in New Jersey work for businesses of that size. So they're, they're mm. big and they're there. Yeah. So Tony, let me ask you, um, we've had a long time partnership with you. We've done seminars 
together with Commerce and Industry Association. My Lessons in Leadership column runs in the magazine Commerce magazine as well. Leadership is a huge component of the work that commerce does. Talk about it, Tony. Yeah, I mean, I think it's important. And, and just to add about what Dennis said about small business and the importance of small business, I can tell you that a lot of our small businesses are 20 employees or fewer, and a lot of them are actually family-owned businesses, right? And, and so when you talk about leadership, it's a culture, right? It's, it's you know, every company is different, but what fascinates me when I talk to our members, whether it's a bank, whether it's a manufacturer, a new marketing company, first question I'll ask that CEO is, uh, I'll ask him or her, what is your culture and what is your leadership style? And across the board, I hear it's all about empathy, right? You got to work with your employees. You got to be emotional. You got to be passionate. So leadership is part of the fabric of running a business. I mean, without it, the business fails. Speaking of leaders, jump in, Mary. Yeah, definitely, Dennis. So Tony talked a little bit about that human side of things. Talk a, talk a little bit about what is Delta Dental doing specifically to help and support small businesses we're almost three years by the time this airs, it will be about three years into the pandemic. I can't believe that we're even saying that. What are you doing to help support these small businesses? What most do you feel like they need? Well, for the past several years, pre-pandemic even, Delta Dental New Jersey has put an emphasis on the small business market segment. Um, specifically, you know, we offer a entire portfolio of over 200 benefit plan options, many of which are offered to Fortune 1000 companies, to small businesses. So we, we have options and we have options that, that are priced from anywhere from $17 a month uh, all the way upwards, depending on the selection of the plan. In, in addition, when you look at dentistry in New Jersey, most dentists are in fact small businesses. They employ right. three, four, five, ten people at, at, at the most uh, on average. So we, you know, tremendously support obviously our, our, our dentists. I mean, they are our product and programs. Um, so we give both dentist offices and small businesses, the employers in the state, the tools uh, through our through our website, through other mechanisms to uh, to operate just as we would provide any large Fortune 1000 business. And, and lastly, in, in, in recognition of the challenges that the pandemic and an inflationary and challenging economy has brought, we just we just recently lowered our pricing um to uh to these small businesses so we are more affordable than ever which is key in this economy you know tony listening to dennis talk about delta dental and its commitment to small business lowering prices because obviously the economics are huge here the economy issues of inflation three years into COVID, it it causes me to i've been thinking about this for for a long time but i want to bring it to you in our company, Stand and Deliver, we do leadership development for all kinds of organizations, but they're usually larger organizations that can afford, we're not cheap, be super candid, executive coaching, leadership development seminars. What the heck does a small business do as it relates to leadership development? Because whether it's our firm or any other firm, it's not cheap bringing in outside folks to do this. So how does leadership development, coaching, mentoring, how does it take place? Is it all internal, Tony? No, good question, Stephen. I think that's where uh, an association like CINJ comes into place, right? A lot of the chambers, too. And in both you and Mary have been on our events where we offer those kind of events and seminars to our small businesses. And they appreciate that, right? Because to your point, to outsource it or to or hire somebody is a, is a cost factor there. But, uh, you know, through our events, we're hopefully able to educate them and inform them on, on techniques. One of the things that I think our events do too, and what companies all often tell me is, and I use Delta Dental as an example. I mean, they're such a great partner, great company that a lot of our small businesses want to learn from the big businesses, right? They say, Tony, what are their best practices? What do they do? What should I be doing here at my company? And forget about what you read in the, in the paper or see on online. They want to hear examples. They want to see examples and, and they want to talk to people like Dennis and his team to kind of just glean off of those examples that they could bring back to their companies. Dennis, is a lot of it sharing 
information, sharing, dare I call them war stories, COVID stories, sharing how organizations are cutting costs, how they're being more innovative. Is a lot of this just sharing ideas, not stealing, but sharing? It, it is absolutely sharing ideas and uh, best practices. Uh, you know, there's, there, there's something that a technology firm in Bergen County might be employing that could be very useful to an accounting firm in, in Middlesex County. You know, it, 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 it's sharing, it's discussing, and, you know, referencing Tony's comments a little bit, these great programs, uh, which we've been a participant and get a lot out of, are mostly virtual, right? So they're, they're online, easy to get to, no traveling, uh, all of that. So, you know, information and sharing is not and should not be lacking. Mary, look, we're, you're where you are, your home. I'm in a home studio. Dennis is in the office, I think. Um, you don't, and you don't have to disclose where you are. But the reality is, we've said this a million times. Look what we are able to do remotely, which would be so much more costly, difficult, challenging, logistics, travel. Not that there's traffic in New Jersey. Not that parking is a problem. But, Mary, this has been for all the horrible things associated with COVID and many, including the suffering, the death of too many families suffering, businesses suffering, this is one advantage. It definitely is, but it definitely begs the question for our smaller businesses. We were very fortunate. We were able to innovate, adapt, and pivot almost on a dime and go to remote uh, setting, right? There are many small businesses that are service-based that were unable to do that and, and to their credit have found a way to get creative. Tony, can you talk a little bit about what some of the people at CINJ, some of your members are saying about 2023, the opportunities this, this new environment may be presenting, especially as they do deal with that challenge of maybe being a small business and not being able to go to that hybrid work environment? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. I could tell you that the past few months have been kind of interesting because I we have seen a trend of a lot of the companies, small and large, kind of bringing their employees back. Because what they tell us is the, the, the employees working from home sometimes are isolated. It's not that camaraderie of going down the hall and talking to somebody. So I think what you're going to see in 2023 is a continuation of the hybrid approach, right? Not to, to you know, nothing new here, but depending on the type of business that you run. Now, the companies that can afford to keep people remote, they're actually thinking outside the box as far as how to take care of their employees. I got to tell you, across the board, a lot of free breakfasts, a lot of free lunches, you know, take your time at lunch, go run an errand if you want, come back. And more importantly, when you're here in the office, make sure that we all meet together as a group. So you're not just sitting in a cubicle or in an office. And we're seeing more of that collaboration going on when they're in the office. And I think as a small business, you got to kind of think outside that box in order to do that. Dennis, jump back in here as I'm listening to Tony. We've had, we have clients, we have some major clients who they've asked people to come back to the office. They want people back in the office, but then they sit there in their office to have 10 Zoom meetings. Yeah, that's, that defeats the purpose, you know, and I'll, I'll uh, add on to what Tony say, said, all excellent points. It's the collegiality, the interaction, that impromptu poking one's head in another one's office saying, hey, I'd like to run this by you. Um, I'd like yeah. to discuss the following with you. Um, you know, it's all about the contact, the interaction, the sidebars, if you will. Um, you know, and I'll give you a very, very quick example. Uh, I, I had a meeting of my uh, staff, my direct reports on a Friday um, that was in person. The meeting, the meeting, everyone was there. We were all in the boardroom uh, discussing what we needed to discuss. The conversation was was lively, to some degree, jovial. To some, we had we hadn't seen each other person to person for a month or so, right? It was like uh, the camaraderie could not be beat. That's culture right there. Uh, contrasting that to a meeting I, we had the following Monday, much larger group, right? Um, that was virtual. It just wasn't the same. And I could, I could just feel it. And the outcome of those discussions, although both productive, were both very different. You know, we have, I have a whole theme on meeting culture. 
that Dennis is talking about. I, one of my favorite, I've got, Mary doesn't like that I have these. Can we zoom on this? <laughs> we can see it just fine. <laughs> Mary and I are gonna talk about meetings and virtual meetings, in-person meetings and your meeting culture and what it has to do with leadership and organizational effectiveness. But boy, did Dennis just hit on something. They're in the room together, they're connected, there's energy, it's engaging, and then remote, it got, it's gone. I've argued, and I'm not gonna get on my soapbox here, I'll do it after we let Tony and Dennis go. It doesn't have to be as deadly as the, a lot of those virtual meetings are. But uh, Tony, Dennis, cannot thank you enough for continuing our small business series. You see the Chiron up there. Again, go to the Delta Dental website, go to the Commerce and Industry Association website, incredible partners here at Lessons in Leadership. And uh, we we thank you, gentlemen. We're taping this at the end of 2022. So it's, Mary, it's not too early to say, have a great 2023, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, Steve and Mary. Thank you. Lessons in Leadership. Mary and I will be back with some final thoughts right after this. Promotional support for this edition of Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague, Mary Gamba, has been provided by NJ.com. NJBIA and New Jersey Business Magazine, CIANJ and Commerce Magazine. Welcome back, Lessons in Leadership. You saw me show this before. Mary, this meeting really should have been an email. I'm going to bring Frank into this. Elvin's here so you can tell us what to do and when to get out of here. Mary, why do so many meetings suck? Because so many professionals believe that having more meetings is better, that more is going to get accomplished. So what happens is they call everybody into that meeting, whether it's in person or even worse via Zoom, and you have 20 boxes filled without an agenda, without a specific objective. And even worse, at the end of that meeting, nothing is agreed to in terms of who's doing what. So they're time wasters. Yeah. Speaking of time wasters, Frank, Frank's Chiron will be up. He's so much more than our audio engineer. He's, he's, he's been in a, a few meetings in his lifetime. What's the worst thing Frank Brown, about a meeting that you're sitting in, like, why am I here? Go ahead. What's the worst? The worst, the worst thing is when people who have absolutely nothing to say decide that they want to start speaking. <laughs> and they could have a full agenda. There could be some real significant things that we need to cover. But the people who just have to be heard, whose opinion, it, it, whose answer becomes an opinion, it, it it just becomes a full waste of time and they just want to be heard and act as if they're significant when they're really not. Well, you know, it's so interesting to have Frank saying that, Mary, in our leadership academy, we have these leadership academies at different companies. We actually teach, quote unquote, facilitation skills, meaning how to moderate, how to be a point guard, a quarterback, keep things moving, right? And what Frank just said about that person, just try to, I call it Bogarts, which is you try to Bogart the meeting, which is an old school Newark expression I grew up with. Frank knows as well. You Bogart the meeting. You took the meeting and ran with it. What's the facilitator need to do, Mary? People, my, our clients say, oh, I can't interrupt. <laughs> that, yes, we call it strategic interruption. So this way they can say to that person, Steve, I know you feel you have a lot to add to this conversation. We want to make sure that we stay on time. Let's get back on track. And then that the moderator, or the facilitator could then pull that meeting back in and then engage someone that maybe has not had as much to say during that meeting. Because that's just as bad. Having that person who's not saying anything in that meeting is just as dangerous as having that person that's sucking up all the oxygen in the room. And Frank, got 30 seconds left real quick. Uh, what percentage, Frank, be conservative in your estimate. How many meetings don't need to be a meeting and should have been an email or a call or a text or something? 85%. <laughs> wow. 80, 85%. That's a conservative estimate. Uh, we don't have a lot of meetings, Elvin, but every time we talk, it's constructive and productive. Fair? Fair. Yes. Yes. Is that why you, is that why you wrote goodbye in the chat? Yes. Three, two, one. See you next time. <laughs> this edition of Lessons in Leadership is made possible by the Bucino Leadership Institute at Seton Hall University. Prager Metis, Valley Bank, the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, the North Ward Center, the New Jersey Sharing Network, Delta Dental of New Jersey, Fedway Associates, Inc., Veolia, Resourcing the World, and Seton Hall University, showing the world what great minds can do since 1856. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. Promotional support for this edition of Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague, Mary Gamba, has been provided by NJ.com, NJBIA, 
and New Jersey Business Magazine, CIANJ, and Commerce Magazine.